Loyal Gazman viewers may remember when we took a look at the age of the merger, a 15-year span where seemingly every Melbourne club looked to shack up with each other to ensure their survival, with Fitzroy ending up joining university in the big football game in the sky by merging with the Brisbane Bears in the only successful merger in the league's history. Of course, there were more than a few unsuccessful attempts during this time. Today, we're going to indulge in a bit of alternate history and ask what the AFL would look like if all of its proposed mergers, relocations, and new teams went ahead. Now, there are some conditions before we begin. These proposals have to have been well established. A lot of these entities were ruled down in true sliding doors moments, learn how to use that goddamn phrase, Damien Barrett, and so were highly likely to have happened but for one or two factors. For example, the merger talks between Fitzroy and the Bulldogs only only didn't happen because of a legal loophole, whereas talks between Fitzroy and Richmond were nowhere near as advanced. And for those who've followed my history of the VFL series, I'm also not acknowledging the VFA era mergers, the potential VFA VFL merger of 1944, nor Collingwood's 1896 proposal to create a VFL equivalent by merging eight different teams into four. These change things far too fundamentally, far too early, for me to speculate on further. Also, I'm not going anywhere near the chaos of 1924, where the VFL were too slow to admit public service, which meant they eventually drafted in these three and completely changed the complexion of the league. Public service would likely not have lasted past the Second World War due to professionalism and recruitment issues anyway, rather like university. All this also assumes the VFA just sits back and does exactly the same things as our universe did. Anyway, I'll begin in the mid-1950s. Ballarat become the 13th VFL team. Rumours of their involvement in the VFL stretch back to talks back in 1894. In 1955, the Ballarat Football Club formally applied to be part of the VFL, with their league forming a composite side. Geelong and Collingwood's presidents supported the inclusion of a Ballarat side, and there was supposed to be a subcommittee formed to push through their entry. Since Bendigo were also in talks as early as 1951, my hypothetical will include both the inclusion of the Ballarat Swans, renamed Imperials thanks to South Melbourne, from 1957, and a brand new composite Bendigo side from 1958 named the Dragons after Bendigo's strong Chinese contingent. This also changes the base number of games in a season from 1970 onward, from 22 to 26 to accommodate 14 teams playing twice. Finals are shifted to October, popularised by Mike Brady's famous One Day in October anthem, <clears throat> with the grand final replay abolished in 1970 so that football is not played in November. See how easy things can change already. These two teams existing also affects proposed country zoning rules, robbing Carlton and St Kilda of their zones. Potentially, this means the VFL institutes a draft instead of country zoning, but I will keep country zoning as a factor for now to more closely align this universe with ours, rearranging things like so. Things then continue on as they are for a while. 1980. Fitzroy attempts to undercut every other team by moving to Sydney. The only thing that stopped this in real life was an extraordinary members meeting in which the members voted down this proposal, or five of them. In this universe, the Fitzroy board makes a better go of it and wins the fans over. Fitzroy lives on, but in Sydney, locking South Melbourne in, well, South Melbourne, except not really. They moved to VFL Park, as was half of their wish, with Lakeside Oval falling into disrepair, eventually taken over by Victoria Athletics, as it has been today. The draft system gets implemented as per the Blue Report, see this video for more, in 1986, just like our universe. It was an inevitability, with Ballarat and Bendigo really highlighting the disparity of country zoning, making up for the lack of a Silvio Faschini in this universe. I mean, I don't know, maybe this time around Gary Pert takes the AFL to court or something. Wiser heads prevail at ownership tables, with Edelston's unlikely partnership with West Tech falling through, meaning the Basil Sellers-led, more boring but more stable ownership group wins out. They sensibly build a team within their means. This means no big spending on Warwick Kappa and Greg Williams, for example. 
Although results generally elude them, no major financial crises within the organisation means that they can keep John Longmire and Wayne Carey, who hard carry the Sydney Lions through the 1990s. In 1985, two Perth businessmen approached St Kilda to offer them the chance to be the first WA-based VFL team. Talks were brief, and so I will not count this as being a viable move. This was one of many talks that clubs had with private investors, but as in our universe, many clubs are scared off from this route due to the low levels of success for Sydney and later Brisbane. Well, except for one. For 1987, Richmond attempts to clear their million dollar debts by moving all their home games to Brisbane. Alan Bond, new president, declares that the $12 million cost of this exercise will be offset by floating the club as a company on the public market. They get shouted down and then fall into last and into more financial peril. So in this universe, Richmond is so desperate for money that they do it. They move. But ironically, they lose a ton of cash as the market implodes. They're in trouble. Debts in the millions, and Alan Bond is soon ousted as a pariah. The Brisbane Bears actually gain from this, as in 1987, even the new boys in the league are more fun to watch week to week than those cursed Tigers, and thus gain some fans. Meanwhile, Bendigo has become a team that punches well above its weight thanks to the services of guys like John Nichols, Trevor Keogh, and Jeff Southby. But they've been struggling to deal with increased player payments thanks to their low attendance. Their biggest ground only holds about 10,000 people and would have asbestos in its stands until 2011. Ballarat has almost gone down the gurgler entirely, having nearly won more wooden spoons than games in the late 70s and early 80s due to their lacklustre recruitment. Only Tony Lockett has saved them from the precipice. As the league professionalises, as stadium sizes grow to 40,000 or more, these two find themselves relics of a bygone era. The VFL sees the value in country football, though, and quietly suggests a merger. Bendigo is keen to shore up its finances thanks to a larger population base in Ballarat, not to mention mumblings of a new dedicated playing arena, which is now known as Eureka Stadium, as well as the prospect of poaching Lockett. Ballarat also favours the move to create a unified and higher quality side to represent country footballers as a whole. Merger incentive money goes into grassroots country football in both zones and to developing a ground in Bendigo without asbestos in it. And so in 1989, Ballarat Bendigo takes to the field with new coach and proud Bendigo boy Ron Barassi leading the side. They play six games a year in Ballarat, Five in Bendigo, one in Shepparton, and one in a different Victorian regional zone that rotates yearly. This does wonders for regional Victorian football. Around the same period, the West Coast Eagles and Brisbane Bears enter the league. The Eagles find almost immediate success despite almost collapsing financially, while the Bears completely waste a talented mid 90s squad as they almost become financially destitute, struggling to compete against merged super teams, but we'll get to that. Back to the mid-1980s. For all intents and purposes, I am going to assume that South Melbourne assumes a similar level of debt and or desperation as Fitzroy, and thus have similar merger talks. This is reasonable, I feel, as the VFL had already locked off developmental funding for their Lakeside Stadium, which continued to fall behind in quality. There was no going back there. Attendance craters at their new home of VFL Park, as it soon will do for St Kilda. And the club is circling the drain it's fair to assume that they would have similar debts to what Fitzroy would have had at this time had they not moved to Sydney. And when the merger talks with Footscray get floated about, the VFL do it properly this time by closing the weird loophole in their argument and not letting either club walk out with their VFL licence still in their trouser pocket. In 1989, the South Melbourne Bulldogs hit the field. They will play at VFL Park, with occasional home games at Witten Oval once it has been extensively upgraded with the new combined merger funds. The irony that Witten Oval is further north than these clubs and not named South Melbourne is lost on very few. In 1990, Port Adelaide makes a bid to enter the VFL, now called AFL. Glenelg raises an injunction to the Supreme Court, but in our universe, they and the SANFL 
lose the case and the Port Adelaide Magpies become the team for all South Australians. That felt really, really dirty coming out of my mouth. With Eddie Maguire stuck as a mere beat reporter for the moment, and with the VFL desperate to conquer SA, they keep their colour scheme and nickname, as was the deal in our real universe that was arranged with Ross Oakley. They will play at Alberton with finals and big matches at Adelaide Oval, as the SA and NFL have barred Port Adelaide from their other venues, particularly Football Park. Port will eventually expand Alberton's capacity to 30,000, and the stadium becomes a perfect mix of professional facility and suburban ground, at least until parking on match days. Player poaching is kept to a minimum due to Port's breakaway from the SA League, so they go hunting in country football to fill out a roster that's already fairly decent by VFL standards. They also add Craig Bradley from Carlton in a mega trade. The SA NFL, for now, stays highly viable, with their other clubs operating as normal. The VFL, back when it was called that, was serious about expansion to America, so much so that Ross Oakley even discussed a plan to relocate a Victorian side there. However, in this universe, he's already lost two Victorian sides to mergers and relocations, and is about to lose another, so he's happy if the USA side becomes a standalone entity. In 1987, a businessman called Errol approached the VFL with a $10 million offer to host a team in Los Angeles, which actually happened in real life, by the way, that proposal. The Crocodiles would play 8-10 to 10 games in America per year and become an all-American-based venture within five years. The VFL was already receiving hundred grand per year in ESPN broadcasting revenue until 1986, 16% of what it was being offered by Australian TV broadcasters, with Oakley having received vague offers in the millions of dollars from US markets in the late 80s as well. The VFL's incentives packages for mergers had basically broken even with the influx of new licensed payers for new franchises, so an additional $10 million would help fund more mergers should they be necessary, rather than plunge the VFL into more debt than the $20 million or so it finds itself in now. So in this universe, Ross Oakley accepts. However, he gives time to the ambitious LA backers so that they can build a solid foundation. Oakley knows about the negotiations with South Australia, he's actually part of them, so he and the LA Consortium sign a deal that allows the Los Angeles Crocodiles to enter the league alongside the entity that would be known as Port Adelaide to keep the league at an even number of teams. The dip in teams in the late 80s as mergers happened also saw Oakley reopen negotiations with the ACTAFL. In real life, they made a deal around this time to enter a Canberran team in the VFL Reserves League. This begins a deal similar to the one that Port Adelaide had with Oakley himself in our real-life universe, in that if a requirement for a 16th team came up, Canberra would receive it. However, a second WA team was already first in line. Peter Scanlon had a big idea in the early 1990s. Melbourne United, the combination of three Melbourne power clubs. However, it didn't work, largely because it was hard to sort particulars between the Lions, Tigers and Roos. But Scanlon said that despite that, he nearly got it done. With no Lions fighting at the table and an embattled Tigers struggling to field a side, the two clubs agree to a deal. The North Melbourne Tigers are born for 1994. That's a tentative date. I don't exactly know when these talks went down. Probably in this universe with Richmond being so financially in debt, it might have happened earlier. The league now has an uneven amount of teams, which are solved the next year by Fremantle becoming the 16th team. It's hard to tell how the Saints are going. They managed to land decent concessions in the country's zoning lottery, sharing their zone with Hawthorne in a bizarre but necessary move since Ballarat was now off limits. But Bob Keddie's 1971 heroics mean that Hawthorne has become most draftees' preferred destination. And no Ballarat zone means no unlikely saviour in 1987 Brownlow medalist Tony Lockett. Come the 1990s, they're struggling. And in 1995, John Elliott's proposal to St Kilda carries through, with the St Kilda board allowing themselves to be taken over after Carlton fall short of winning the 1995 flag, with no Craig, Bradley and Diesel to pin down that midfield. The Carlton Saints are born, and St Kilda goes to the grave with one premiership. They will merge for 1997, allowing St Kilda a final farewell run, ironically closing their doors a year before they would have appeared in a grand final. 
In 1996, Melbourne and Hawthorne were also in trouble. Hawthorne's success has been diluted as some of their premiership talent instead went to St Kilda. The controversial Melbourne Hawks merger was scuttled by Don Scott's typically aggressive efforts in campaigning, but in this universe... His jersey-tearing antics are seen as childish, and the disrespect of Kennedy and Jeans at the Hawks event is seen far more negatively by media. The league has already begun to see the benefits of mergers now. The Bendigo-Ballarat merger has allowed Greg Williams and Tony Lockett to join forces, becoming one of the most entertaining teams in the league, while the Bulldogs have gone from strength to strength themselves. So the Demons and the Hawks merge and play their final games as sole entities against each other at the end of 1996. These mergers bring the league down to 14 teams, but the AFL has been planning for this. As I said earlier, Canberra had a standby deal in which they would become a 16th team if required, but Fremantle was in the queue before them, much like they were in front of Port Adelaide in real life. Speaking of Port Adelaide, they needed an SA rival, and they don't come any better than Norwood. With Port Adelaide now not needing to apply for a licence throughout the 1990s, and with the AFL extremely keen to establish two teams in SA while establishing dominance over the SA NFL, access for the second SA licence is wide open. Norwood and Sturt's joint proposal, which involved the successful Norwood and financially destitute Sturt clubs merging, as was seriously considered in real life and was ignored largely due to the AFL wanting Port Adelaide, well, in this universe, Port Adelaide's already an AFL mainstay, and this option becomes reality as the best remaining choice. Unlike with Port, the SANFL allows the new entity to pinch as many players as it wanted from the league. We're the league still not weakened much by the AFL, with limited poaching from Port, and many established stars seen as unfashionable to draft in the new youth-focused age of the draft, or outright not wanting to play in the AFL under other banners, Norwood Sturt fields an intimidatingly good roster. The SA NFL admits a new Eastern Suburbs team, Kensington, as well as the Adelaide University Seniors team to stay afloat. The SA NFL will later relent to allow AFL reserves sides in their competition. The Magpies and the Sturt Double Blues, reformed as their own entity under the Norwood umbrella to keep the club spirit alive, in a sense. In 1999, in our universe, Carlton was at it again, trying to merge, but this time with North Melbourne. With both these sides having merged with other clubs in the 90s and both having success in very recent times, again, I don't see this merger happening in this universe, even with all the other mergers going on around it. So things continue as normal. Things then stay pretty normal in terms of teams until 2008. With Canberra no longer a problem, the AFL's attention is solely focused on the Gold Coast. The Southport Sharks have been at the AFL's heels for a dozen years. In real life, they offered to entice a Melbourne-based side believed to be the Demons to relocate in 2004, with Hawthorne and North Melbourne also expressing interest over time. In this universe, Melbourne's financial difficulties have been allayed by their merger with the asset-rich Hawks. North's haven't, though, merging as they did with a Richmond that was basically bankrupt. Southport continues to speak to North, and the AFL snaps. They offer a still financially embattled North Melbourne Tigers, who never got to have Wayne Carey in this universe as he wasn't sold by Sydney for a packet of magic beans, $100 million over five years to move to the Gold Coast. And in this universe, the board accepts, which means Jimmy Brayshaw is never here, which means he has more time for media commitments, which is a shame. The Sharks merge with the Tigers, providing more financial assistance and a ready-made training facility to become the North Coast Tiger Sharks. The AFL wants more, though. Yes, they have a team in Canberra, but it isn't doing much to soak up a large Sydney market who, as in real life, are somewhat hesitant to latch on to a relocated Victorian side, which in this universe never had Tony Locker as he chose to stay in Ballarat. The AFL choose to open up a second franchise in Sydney. After playing with a not-that-serious idea of an all-Irish team based in Sydney in 2008, the AFL choose to open up a second, proper franchise in Sydney, but they'll need to open up an 18th side as well to avoid the problem of a buy. Luckily, there's one all-too-forgotten market that hasn't got an AFL side yet. Tasmania. 
After years of trying, they finally get their team and begin playing out a Utah Stadium in 2011 armed with a freshly poached Jack Rewalt. And in 2012, GWS make their debut as they did in real life. Future expansions have been touted, but nothing was actioned until 2022, where the Northern Territory finally won the AFL license they've been fighting for since the 1990s. The NT Magic will enter the league in 2028, splitting time between Marara Oval and Traeger Park. The 20th license will go to another international market, one much closer than the USA, New Zealand, whose last AFL bid was in 1987. A nation that has produced some genuinely amazing footballers, the Falcons will enter in 2030 and will split time between Auckland and Wellington. That's our league, but how about the players within it? And how would the AFL ecosystem be affected? Well, post-zoning, that's hard to speculate, but there are some things that I can read as certain enough that could possibly happen in this universe. Carey and Longmire become the forward line of the 1990s, saving Sydney football and winning the 1996 Grand Final, ending a 52-year drought for Fitzroy in the year that they went extinct in real life. Tony Modra becomes a Norwood Sturt legend. Mm -hmm. The Magpies win an unlikely flag in 1993, but the Victorian super teams dominate from that point on. The South Melbourne Bulldogs do good work, but they fall short in the late 90s as the Carlton Saints become an absolute superpower, ending up knocking off that Sydney side. Which means Robert Harvey and Stewie Lowe both win flags, which is nice. Uh, Brisbane, uninterrupted by the real-life merger, although badly hit financially for a while, go on to do what they did, hiring Lee Matthews to finish the job for them, winning three flags in a row and then being stopped by a determined Norwood Sturt in 2004. West Coast then go on a run of dominance before Geelong just decided to take over the AFL for a while, with the Hawks not sucking enough in the 2000s to have both Franklin and Roughhead at the core of their revival. Hell, maybe not even getting one of them. The only other main rival that's still properly intact is Collingwood, but they don't sneak through thanks to the combined force that is the Carlton Saints, taking it in 2010 in extra time. During this time, South Melbourne get close again with Cooney, Johnson, Hall and Franklin. Yes, I'm putting him on that team, nearly getting them a premiership in 2009 and 10, but again, they fail to win on the day. Their premiership drought extends to, depending on how you want to look at it, 62 or 83 years before getting the job done in 2016 against the team that took South Melbourne's place in Sydney before South could even move. The irony is lost on everyone but the biggest of footy nerds. From there, it's hard to tell. A lot of this is speculation, and since 2005, every flag has been pretty much decided by the draft alone, and there's no real way of telling who gets good at what time. As for players, well, Gary Ablett stays at Geelong all his life, since the Gold Coast don't have a full expansion team and Nathan Ablett to lure him with. With no Brent McCaffrey tackle and with a good team around him, God knows how many extra flags they win. With no Richmond in the mix and with the Melbourne Hawks probably mid-table at the time he's drafted, after Dustin Martin probably ends up in Tasmania. Mason Cox definitely ends up in LA. Andrew McLeod becomes a Port Adelaide legend, as he would have left Fremantle anyway, and that was the first team he was based in. Nathan Buckley starts at Port Adelaide and then becomes the first player to move to a team with the same jersey uh, upon the Collingwood trade. Edgy. Uh, Jack Rewalt was poached by Tasmania in 2011, where he created a terrifying forward line combo with fellow Tassie Ben Brown, thanks to an academy concession. Justin Blumfield becomes Canberra's first icon. Dane Beams becomes a Tiger Shark uh, thanks to his uh, junior work with Southport, meaning that Collingwood never receives Bears hero Jack Crisp, and Beams ends up with Kurt Tipper and Matthew Richardson, who became a North Melbourne legend thanks to him having his first year at Richmond right before the merger, retiring a Brownlow winner in Gold Coast's first season. And speaking of players who are father-sons, uh, JPK and Jack Viney become Melbourne Hawks. Luke Darcy and Tom Liberatore continue their family legacies in South Melbourne colours. Jared Malloy finds success as Sydney's first father-son pick. And Ben Keyes ends up being on the team that was his opposition for this moment, which, which is fun. Again, this is all just fun conjecture, and all I'm saying is that only in a universe where every vaguely realistic relocation and merger went ahead, this is what the AFL would probably look like today. 
So, what are your predictions for what happened in this footballing landscape? Were there any mergers that you'd like to have seen go ahead? Or did I destroy your club's history and legacy in this universe? In which case, sorry. Whatever the answer, whatever the question, let me know your thoughts in the comments, and I'll catch you next time. And thanks so much again to the lifeblood of this channel, the Patreon members. Cody Bibby, some geek from Twitter, Emmanuel Can Cant, Seamus O'Dowd Clancy, Grittio M, Renegar, and our newest member, Nathan Krauseratus. Hopefully I've said all of those correctly, let me know if I haven't. Thank you all so much for your continued support. I release all my videos on Patreon early, as well as uh, exclusive content, such as uh, I had a couple of travel diaries from my uh, Australia tour, as well as uh, just uh, random facts, newspaper clippings I find in my research, and, and all these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, feel free to swing on by, see if it's up your alley, and, um, yeah, hopefully join. That'd be fantastic. So uh, thank you all so much, and I'll see you on the next video.